live.com, a sister website of the Springfield Republican. Interesting. So he's just a young guy. Yeah, it's kind of sad to watch the IJ. They're they're part of the, what's called the Bay Area News Group, and yeah. they've all just kind of contracted. Uh, the Chronicle even has had to contract to a degree. But this will be interesting to talk to Al, because we're going to get into the business of uh, journalism, online, and okay. uh, print, and it'll be interesting. We can okay, well, why don't we do our first two minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't have to talk specifically about that. If you want to get into 49ers or Warriors, whatever you want to talk to me, he's yeah, fine. But I think he would be really good for at least one segment to talk about the uh, challenge. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. And I'm sure you have some questions that would be... Yeah. No, no, no. I, yeah, think, yeah. I, think, I think it'll be yeah. very good. I thought uh, this would be something to be up your alley. Yeah, no, this yeah, is perfect. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, because I've got, I'm not recording the radio show here afterward, I have to go to Nevada. So oh. that's why I'm on a kind of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Let's go. All right. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah. No, you're yeah. right on time, too. Great, perfect. great. Okay, here we go. Well, welcome. You're listening to Sports Econ 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Now, today's show is going to be interesting because who's going to be our guest today? Well, we're going to talk about something that I think is near and dear to our hearts because we're radio broadcasters, but they are related to us, and that is the print journalism and where it's going. We're going to uh, speak to a rather prominent sports editor from the San Francisco Chronicle, a good friend of ours, and talk about the future of print journalism and online writing and sports. I think it'll be really interesting. Yeah, it should be because you have a lot of situations where you know there's so much online stuff with the blogging and then... You the know, tweeting. Like, tweeting, yeah. yeah. And then how much of it is just like taken from the Associated Press, right? Yeah. And, you know, how much is independent? Very good point. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, in the old days, they used to fly these guys all over the place. Oh, yeah. No, you'd see it. It was interesting. We can get into that. The, the difference in reporting, because I still go to games today, Edward. And the difference in reporting today and how it was done just even 15 years ago. Dramatic change. Wow. Dramatic change. Okay. At each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question, and uh, today's theme, again, is just miscellaneous sports, because I don't want you to get ahead of yourself and think, <laughs> okay, what are we doing? I got this one. Football? Yeah. In fact, let's see, are these questions, uh, uh, there's an easy one, uh, there's a hard one, and then I think there's another hard one. Oh, okay. Well, well you see. usually throw some pretty tough ones at me, I, you know. That's because you have this reputation of knowing, of, of the know-all. I'm one of those idiot savant types. I can remember, you know, the guy's birth date from some yeah. ball player I saw <laughs> back in the 50s. But when it's my own anniversary, you know, with my wife. Uh, oh, that's right. It's on Thursday. That yeah, next week. All right. You can't mess that one. No, you don't happy want to mess wife, that one. Happy life. That's it, man. All right. This segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, still providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding. Uh, they're just a little hair under 8% right now, about 7.93%. You should check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. Uh, they have very conservative investments in the mortgage industry. And stay with us because you're listening to Sports Econ 101, and we will be right back. And a lot of interesting news about the Raiders with this whole Las Vegas thing. I know Al would love to talk about that. Okay. We can get into that. And also related to the kind of season they're having, which is really Yeah, the Chiefs game, man. That was tough. Well, you know what happened is that they gave up a couple of big plays early, and then their offense could oh. never get on track. Chiefs got a great defense. They they had their opportunities. They had three times they got the ball inside the uh, 50 on turnovers, and they only converted that into, uh, what was it, six points. Not good. you got to at least get 10. If they'd gotten 10, they would have been in that game right up until the end. Yeah. But, you know, these things happen. It's probably good that they lost just because it'll put a little more fire on them. They're going yeah. to San, they're going to San Diego Sunday night. Oh, just got to kick. Yeah. You know, San Diego is so beat up right now. Yeah. Such bad shape. What was the deal about uh, the Rams talking about it being like a high school team or something? Oh, yeah. Well, Jeff Fisher, you know, just he paid the price for what, what was this final in that game against it? Like something 48 to 7? And Jared Goff looked awful. I tell you, there's a guy. He he got his money, yeah. but he should have stayed another, spent another year in high in uh, at Berkeley, yeah, because he just wasn't ready. Yeah. Well, he didn't have a good, and he didn't have a good team around him. If he had a decent team around him, he might have been okay. But you you throw a young, a young quarterback who's green in with a young line like that, eh, mm. recipe for disaster. Exactly. All right. Let's yeah. see if we can get Al on the phone. All right. Al Sarasovich, answer your phone. Or they'll be held at pay. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to stiff us. I can sense it. That's two rings. <laughs> Three rings. Gal. Pick up. Pick up. He's a cut here. Hey, there we go. 
Is there? Is that Al? We were just about. <laughs> we were just about to say Al. We were just about to say he's not going to pick up. He's stiffing us. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> so Al, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Edward Brown, and of course you know Bruce. Sure. Okay. So uh, I'm going to let uh, Bruce take off. What we'll do is we'll just do the quick intro. Uh, he'll introduce you, and then we'll just go from there. How's that? That works for me, uh, Bruce uh, Sarasovic. I know. Sarasovic. Right. There you go. I keep calling you Sarasovic, but it's Sarasovic. It could go either way. It all depends on what part of the world you're in. But That's right. Well, there's no H on this one, so Sarasovic. Uh, so, right. Yeah. So, so, so it, it spell. It, it sounds just like spell. Like, sounds like it's spelled. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, right. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Bruce, who do we have on the phone? Oh, we have a good friend of ours who is the sports editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, the largest uh, paper in Northern California, and Al Sarakovic. I knew I was going to blow that. Sarasovic, right? <laughs> is that, that's the right pronunciation, right, Al? You got it right, Bruce. Oh, boy. We, we're, not, we're not even out of the shoot, and I'm already mispronouncing <laughs> our guest's name. Hey, you were upset when he didn't answer after the first two minutes. That's minutes. right. You know, I'll tell you. <laughs> you can call me Al, like the just, says. Just call you Al. Well, well you're, you've got a fascinating job because the, the challenge we we face today, those of us who work in, in broadcast or you're in the journalism business, uh, print journalism business as you're in, is that things are constantly changing, especially with, with the, all of the new 21st century media. And you guys have had to get on board. And I just want to ask you about the challenge that that presents because your reporters that go to games now, I see them not only covering the game, but they're having, some of them are having to tweet while they play it, while they're doing it. Now, Bruce Jenkins has said he won't do that when you're fine calling this. But I mean, some of the, some of the uh, beat writers actually have to do that. It's, it's more challenging today in some respects, isn't it, Al, to cover. Uh, to be a field reporter and just be out there, you know, with the hoi polloi and, and, and you know, covering the main event. It's yeah, you, you're you're entirely right. It's a, it's changed dramatically. My time at these papers, and uh, I just got twenty year mark. The daily newspaper, uh, uh, paperman here in San Francisco, starting with the uh, old San Francisco Examiner, then moving over to the Chronicle when we merged. Oh, congratulations! Uh, by the way, that's quite twenty years of uh, surviving in this business. That's a <laughs> it's a fabulous ride. I've learned a lot of different things here, and uh, during that ride, I've, I've seen development of multiple platforms of media. It, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, it goes way beyond tweeting, Bruce. You know, all of our staffers, myself included, uh, anytime we're out at an event or interviewing someone, uh, we could very well be uh, taping the interview. Uh, we could be videotaping and uh, sending instant video online. Uh, we use social media like Twitter and Facebook to promote our stories, our videos, our own photos. So you become a, a kind of a, a, a one-person uh, production team out in the field right now. And it's, it's pretty amazing. The, the idea of watching the game and writing a story afterwards is long gone. Uh, you're basically engaged with your readership throughout the event. And, uh, you know, even Mr. Jenkins, he's right here in the office. Um, as a brace on the, uh, the, the Twitter. I know there, there was a time when Chris was concerned about <laughs> coming into the social media, but he's actually quite good at it. He has a strong following. Bruce has a Twitter following? Are you kidding me? I never thought. <laughs> no, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do that. That'll give me a reason to get into Twitter. I, you know, people ask me if I tweet. I said no, but I pass gas. You know? <laughs> um, so, so our fr our good friend Vern Glenn. I mean, he's on TV, and he says he's having to do a lot of his own camera work. I see Vern out there all the time with his camera. Yeah, I mean, I, this, this is all part and parcel with kind of different things going on. We have the emergence of digital media, which is uh, clearly the uh, the present and the future because most of our readership uh, comes uh, via you know digital devices. And then the, the other side of that coin is you have uh, reduced revenue in, in various media outlets, so that means reduced staff. So we're a lot more to less people. And I think that's why you do find, like Vern Glenn, I'll see him out in the parking lot carrying his camera into the, mm -hmm. into the event. Um, and you can see me out there uh, shooting video during pregame interviews. Uh, no, that's, a, that's a true story. I have actually seen Al, and I was wondering what the heck he's doing. And he's, he's like a cameraman. You're having to wear like 10 hats. What's going on here, man? Is that like doing a bunch of selfies? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy, but uh, it gets a lot of traffic. It's a lot of uh, revenue. Uh, 
Really? Huh. On your website, that you, that that generates enough to, to help supplement what you're getting through the other uh, more traditional sources. Yeah, exactly, and uh, the, the cost uh, the, the you know there was a, a long time where people were simply chasing clicks. Uh, you know, the more clicks you got on stories and web pages, more revenue would be generated. But uh, that is such a rat race. There's so many different outlets chasing clicks that. The, the revenue you can actually generate from that, so, so the ads that get served with each day, is actually diminished. Mm. Uh, mm. So the online business model continues to seek other revenue streams, and the uh, the flavor du jour right now is video. Well, you video can, actually, uh, you can you can uh, basically attach a advertisement to the video. It's something we all hate. Yeah. You know, when you click on a video, and you got to sit there for 15 seconds watching something else. Uh, but you know, for an industry that that I believe is vitally important to our society and democracy, especially now. Um, you know, we need to find ways to support our newsroom. Yeah. Uh, these online elements are, are a big part of that. Yeah, my, my favorite four letter, new four-letter word is skip, you know, for, for on those videos. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in the, in the old days, well, it's interesting, you know, you, you're, on, on one hand, you know, you think, okay, print media, you know, quote, is dead. Uh, and so the you know the revenue should go down, but then on the other side, you know, before you came on, Bruce and I were talking about how in the old days, you know, you guys would be flying all of the reporters all over the country, so now you're saving on all that travel time, right? A lot of times, you know, you get you get fed from the Associated Press, or, or they send one, they send a beat reporter along usually. But you're yeah, what he's what what Edward's saying, I think, is very true, and that's that's tough for you, Al, because I know that you appreciated having grown up in the era when there were so many more reporters, you know, on site. That you had to kind of cut back on that, but that's just reality, isn't it? It's, it's a really difficult and interesting part of my job in, in the uh, in the making process on travel. It just means that um, you know there there was a time that we traveled much more. We had a much larger staff. I think I took over the sports department about seven years ago. I think when I walked into sports right just prior to that, I think we had over thirty people. Mm. We probably have about half of that now. Fifteen people. Yeah. Wow. And how, how many uh, got to fly first class? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you say about fifteen people, then, yeah. 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 <laughs> and by, by the way, how is Glenn doing? Because I have not seen him. And for those that are outside of the Bay Area, don't know who Glenn Dickey is. He, the wonderful, uh, curmudgeonly sports writer. I, I love Glenn because he just you know he was always you know uh, he was like the, he was like that guy who was always tilting against windmills, but he he had a reason for it. But I, I just wonder how he's doing. He was a, a very fine columnist for many, many years with the Chronicle, I guess about 40 years altogether. Is he still around? Is he hanging in there? Uh, indeed, Glenn was the ultimate contrarian and uh, curmudgeon, like you said. Uh, <laughs> I probably saw him about six months ago. Uh, I, you know, I, I hope he's doing great. I, I haven't been in the field as much as I, I'd like to be in recent months, so I, I haven't caught him in, uh, in the press box. I probably since uh, maybe early mid baseball season. Yeah. Uh, Glenn, 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 yeah, good guy. Go ahead. I remember seeing it about something about Glenn because he was kind of back in, in, the, in the, uh, the fast and happy days of newspapers. Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, he was a beat writer of the Raiders back in the '60s when when uh, when Al Davis was a young man and Stabler hadn't even appeared on the scene. And that just reminds me, you know how how important these guys were to us, and they still are to a degree. I mean, I love I'm an older guy, but I love re reading Bruce Jenkins and Scott Osler. You're, I mean, they've been around so long, and their perspective is so it's so worldly. Well, yeah, even the documentaries that are done, they you know, I remember seeing Glenn Dickey on there a few times. Oh, and, Glenn, and I was going to say Glenn and that and that bunch. Of, that for you, Al, and you're a relatively young guy. When I say young, you're you know you're under I believe you're under fifty, aren't you? You're still in your forties. I, I am in the forties. Uh, you're just a child. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that that speaks well for you that to be in your position for as long as you have, and and we got to. You have to take a quick uh, break. We're going to go to a break. Okay, but but I was I was just going to say, hang in there with us, and we'll talk a little bit more about the day to day coverage of sports and the challenges as we uh, continue here. All right. Great. So I'll catch you on the other side. All right. Yes, yeah, yeah, stay, stay with us. Stay, stay with, with us because uh, uh, don't answer this question yet. <laughs> we'll come back from break. And we'll, we'll see if you know the answer to this one. This we'll, one we'll, is, we'll let up, give Al the first crack uh, at this. Yeah. One. Okay. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll start off with somewhat of a softball question. Okay. 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 Have to do with softball. All right. <laughs> when Monday Night Football's first, air, excuse me, when Monday Night Football first aired on ABC in 1970. 
who were the announcers? Oh, that's too easy. That's a little too easy. Okay. Yeah. But we always want to start off with a little bit of. Okay. And, and uh, we'll let you even do your uh, impersonation because Bruce does a, a very good job of. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you. <laughs> it, this was this was pretty easy though. Okay. All right. So that's our question. When Monday Night Football first aired on uh, in 1970 on ABC, who were the announcers? Don't touch that dial because we're, you're listening to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be right back. Al, do you know the answer to that one? I'm guessing so, so, and maybe um, Frank Gifford. You know, it, it, it's a trick question. In a way, it wasn't Frank Gifford. It was Keith Jackson, of all people. Keith Jackson. Yeah. Very good. That's and right. A lot of people the think be, The best right. thing that ever happened to Keith Jackson, he later wrote it in his book. He said, the best thing was being taken off Monday Night Football. At the time, I was really despondent that he became uh, he became the primary voice for NC to a college football, and he did that for what thirty some odd years. So. Totally blanking on his uh, his catchphrase. What was it? Oh, up, Daddy! <laughs> <laughs> Guy would score a touchdown. He go, oh, up, Daddy! Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know is what he, it meant though. He very serious. Oh, he was a, a nice man serious, too. Yeah. I met him a couple. You ever meet uh, Keith Jackson? Now? Uh, no, I don't uh, think I did. Very nice. The hallway of the game. I did some kind. Of, I got to a game real early years ago with the uh, Cal Bears and did a, a quick interview with him. Just a sweetheart of a guy. Is he? Uh, you know, all those, all, yeah. Would you like to address the travel issues? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Let's okay, get it. We'll, 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 yeah, yeah, no, no. It's yeah, a, well, a good point. We'll, we'll, okay, let me just let's, we'll answer the question and then you can start okay. again. Here we go. Let's go back to that because I think people are in the room. Okay, hold, hold on a second. Sure, sure. sure. Okay, I get it. Are, are you, you at the office right now, Al? Yeah. Oh, cool. So, what's the big story that you guys are writing tomorrow? Of course. Oh. There we go. Well, let, let's let's. Okay. Yeah. We yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Good. I'd love to talk about that. Okay. And, uh, Craig Sager. Oh, did he die today? He passed away. Uh, Craig Sager. Craig Sager. TBS. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I need to I need to start off with just five seconds of silence. <laughs> Sports Econ 101. One more time, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Here was our first trivia question. We figured we'd throw a softball one out at you. When Monday Night Football first aired on ABC in 1970, who were the announcers? Well, I know the play-by-play -play announcer. Ho, oh, Daddy! First <laughs> down! But yeah, who, he actually, Keith Jackson, was ABC's play-by-play -play announcer. Then Danny Don Meredith and Howard Cosell, That's of course. right. But the thing about Keith Jackson was he, he that was the best thing that ever happened to him, getting fired from Monday Night Football because they didn't call it being fired, because the network didn't fire him. They just moved him over into college football. And that and, air, that uh, brought the way for Frank Gifford to come in. And that brought, well, Frank Gifford was already there, but that gave him a, a higher profile. It also actually gave so Jackson a higher profile. I thought there was only the three of them. Yeah, that's right. No, Keith Jackson, Howard Cosell, uh, Don Meredith. Don Meredith, right. Okay, so that's three of them. Right. Keith leaves, right. and then they bring on... Then bring on Gifford. Gifford, there you go. There you go, all right. So here we go. Okay. Uh, remind us who our guest is. Yes, Al Sorokovic. There you go. There you go. And I was really working on that. <laughs> Al, did I do okay? Come on. <laughs> call me Al. Thanks for me, guys. Oh, it's great to have you on. Al is a, is a good friend of ours. We've known Al for a while here. He's a fairly young guy, but he's the uh, very fine sports editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, which still I think is is far superior to any local paper. And I'm prejudiced. I've been reading it since I was eight years old, so that's going back a, a long time. But but now we were talking about, before we broke away, about about travel. You still with us? We had a little feedback there. Uh, is Al, you, Al, you stay there? Al, gone. All well, right. we'll just have to get him right back We'll now. get him right back then. I was, gonna, I was just going to mention that, you know, during the time that I was uh, getting into broadcasting, which would be in the mid-1970s as far as uh, on a professional level, uh, we used to travel a fair amount. Um, when I was working in Eureka, they didn't actually pay for all of our expenses. Most of uh, some of them were picked up by the team, but just a different era. And Al, sorry we lost you there. We got you back here. We're, we're, whoops, I guess that <laughs> we got Al. We got Al Silva. I tell you, the wonders of technology here. As Edward plays engineer, I will do as they say. My program director used to say, well, "You're very good at this, Bruce. Fill time." So. No, I was just going to say, though, 
I got to travel a lot with the Oakland Raiders and the San Francisco Giants, and back in those days, the teams actually took the uh, reporters with them and did not charge them. So they were kind of in the back pocket. Uh, but I was not going to worry about that. I was just a kid out of you know college, a couple of years working in Eureka and television, and this was a wonderful experience. Wow. So I got to travel a lot with uh, with the Raiders and the Giants. And now we got Al back with us. Sorry about that. We had some kind of technical problem. We, we were just talking about how travel has changed so dramatically uh, in the uh, sports journalism business, in that you just don't get a chance to send as many reporters to events anymore. You have to kind of. Uh, have people in those areas helping you out. You rely on the wires. You rely on the internet more. But there still is an element of there's nothing quite like being at the event, though. And talk about how tough that has been having that challenge of cutting back on your travel. Because for years, newspapers were always the they would you'd always see you know when a team would come in to play our Bay Area teams, we'd see 15 or 20 guys from the newspapers. Sometimes if it was New York or Chicago, now maybe three or four. We were actually having a fun time with it, Al, because I, I, mean, you, I don't know if you remember Bob Agnew. He used to be the program director at KNBR when I was there for 1988 to 96, but he, or not, uh, 2006. Yeah. But he always used to tell me, he says, if we have some kind of a problem and, and you've just got to fill time, I don't have any problem with you filling time because I know you'll fill time. He says, you, but you when, just can't have that airspace. Yeah. He says, but when you do, but when you do your ninety second update, I want ninety seconds, not two minutes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Good job. Though. I've noticed in the last couple of years, Mitch Stevens, who's your very fine prep uh, writer, really does a nice job covering the local uh, high school, you know, scene. Well, a lot of, uh, yeah, I'm going to sort of guess here a little bit that, you know, the baby boomers have kids who are in high school, and so, you know, that there's there's a big uh, push for that. You know, they want to see how their their kids are doing or the friends, you know, the kids of their friends, stuff like that. Whereas before, you know, there, when there were weren't as many kids, like when I was. I'm one of the tail end of the baby boomers, and so after I left uh, school, you know, the, a lot of these schools, like elementary schools, started closing. People That's true. Just weren't yeah. having kids, so yeah. 
there's a time at which there's not that many kids in high school. Yeah, that's, that's very true. true. Right? So yeah, yeah. Kids that come yeah. I think it's a fantastic market. Again, it's a, uh, it's a costly thing to do. On any given Friday night, you might have over 100 uh, about high school games in the nine county area. So, again, we have to make some decisions uh, on how many people we can employ to do that. Uh, you mentioned Ben Stevens. He's, he's one of a kind. He writes for us as well as Max Trust. And uh, he's able to use his own team of stringers around the Bay Area to aggregate uh, a typical Friday night light kind of package for us. And uh, he does a great job. Wait, one of the... I, 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 we used to have 50 stringers. Is that right? Around the Bay Area. Wow. And that's uh, something that's by the way to mention. So we'll trying to make do with less is just the theme you're going to find. Well, not only do you have to... Not only do you have to pay these guys, but there's only so much paper that you that you want to print. Yeah. That's true. The space of the newsroom is, is a consideration. Also, how many people? I mean, when we did have 50 people out there, I wasn't running the sports at the time, but um, you know, we'd have three or four staffers here on the sports desk taking phone calls, uh, taking dictation, you know, from pay phones and everywhere <laughs> uh, back in the day, and uh, that's another expense too. You know, that sometimes uh, you know we don't have that kind of staff uh, on the desk. No, you guys are doing a fine job. Al Sorokovic uh, for the San Francisco Chronicle sports editor joining us. And, and i got to ask you about covering the Warriors this year. Every day I read something fascinating about the Warriors in your paper. Today there was a really nice uh, feature piece on David West and how his maturity and worldliness has kind of helped keep a, a younger group of, of players that are coming up through the ranks now focused. And, you know, that that is a special challenge, covering a team that's been in two world championships, won one, and is right now the Darlings, the Toast. Whoever thought we'd say the Warriors would be the Toast of the Bay Area? They are clearly head and shoulders above it, yeah. even over the Giants right now, Al. Yeah. So you guys really do have an obligation, not only an obligation, but everybody wants to talk about them. It's a, uh, a daunting prospect, but one that steps up to Tommy Laterno is our new writer on the Warriors this year. For years, Rusty Simmons did a fantastic job on the Warriors. Um, Connor stepped in this year to help out with the beat. Uh, he's hit the ground running, and uh, we also have great uh, uh, columnists of NBA top, uh, primarily Bruce Jenkins and Scott Osler. And Killian writes a good uh, Warriors column, and uh, I also enjoy writing uh, basketball myself. So I, I serve as kind of a, a wild card column columnist for, for everything we do. Uh, but uh, I, know that, I have to say, Al, that is unusual. Sometimes you read the sports editor once a month, but you're on, you know, sometimes a couple times a, a week. And I really like that because we get to know you and, and kind of get a sense for where this paper is going. I appreciate that, Bruce. Um, yeah, it's not very common um, around the country for a sports editor to also write. It's something uh, I've always tried to do. I've been an editor and a, and a columnist for a, a writer uh, throughout my career. I feel like it's important to maintain a connection with the uh, demands of writing. I hope you get paid for both. <laughs> well, <laughs> I get paid and then I do both. Exactly. I, uh, Al, stay, stay with us a minute because when we come back, I do want to ask you about, you know, these uh, uh, NFL teams going to play in London, and then you know if the Raiders play there, how are you going to do that? So we'll, we're going to get that get to that in just a second here. Okay, here's our second commercial okay. break. What is the Adams Award, and who was the first individual to win it? Mm. That's the question. All right. And we want you to email edward at sportsecon101.com and see if you know the answer to this question. What is the Adams Award, and who was the first individual to win it? Don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101 will be right back. All right. got to be hockey, huh? What do you think, Al? I'm thinking hockey. I'm thinking hockey, too. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take a wild step. So. Yeah, don't Google. No fair. <laughs> <laughs> You, you can't tell whether I was Google or not, so you can go ahead and Google, yeah. all, Google all you want, my friend. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, though? You can just pull your cell, your cell phone out and get information, instant information. You know what? I would have done a lot better in college if they would have let me do that. I, it just blows it, it still blows me away, though. Yeah. Well, I, I have, like I tell you, I tell them on the air sometimes. Right. I, 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 I think I figured it out, but I'm not just going to Okay. Back. All right. We'll let you answer the question. Yeah. Well, I tell you, the, uh, like I. Like I've told Bruce before, you know, six years of high school did me pretty well. <laughs> okay. Where'd you grow up, by the way, Al? Uh, I'm a Cleveland. Uh, uh, oh, right. That's, that, that's must, well, that must have been really kind of neat for you, seeing your two yeah. teams, uh, you know, one one almost winning it one and one winning it. Yeah, I was standing on the baseline uh, 
uh, waiting to, uh, yeah. the lawyers and one, I had a bunch of chronicle covers that I was going to hand out to the mayor, you know, the kind of the, the, the damage just covers, which I successfully did in Cleveland a year. Yeah, ago. yeah. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good story, actually. But, oh, let's talk yeah, about that. I, 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 I like to, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. All right, are you ready? Yes. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here along with Bruce McGowan. Second trivia question. What is the Adams Award and who was the first individual to win it? Now, I'm going to say hockey, but I think Al's got the right answer here. What, what, what is it, Al? My, my first guess was hockey as well. And then uh, it, it, it turns out it is the Coach of the Year Award. Okay. That's right. The co- it is the, for hockey. Yeah. For Coach of the Year. Yeah. Okay. So That's what we were right. named after Jack Adams, who was the Hockey Hall of Fame player for Toronto, Vancouver, yeah. and Ottawa. And he was also a coach and general manager of the Detroit Web Wings. And it is for NHL's Coach of the Year. Very good, Al. Hockey reminds me of a, of a cousin that I never got to know because I grew up kind of sort of following the sport but never really got into it until I went away to college. And it's Al, you grew up, what, in Cleveland, so I, I imagine you were exposed to it. But w- did you have a big following you know, per, in your family for hockey? I, my, my high school team had a hockey uh, uh, My high school had a hockey team in Cleveland, Ohio. And I remember staying up late at night. Yeah, and I've never figured that one out. Why doesn't Cleveland have a hockey team? They're right in the heart of, of hockey country. Same thing with Green Bay. They, they actually do. Uh, they have a, uh, a, you know, a second league. I, can't, I think it's an IFL. Okay. Uh, they, and they, they won the championship this year, actually. Uh, wow. Uh, three days before the Cavs won, I was in Cleveland with the Warriors covering the game, and uh, they're called the Lumberjacks. But, uh, the Lumberjacks. So way, way back in the day, there was the Cleveland uh, Barons. That's right. For an NHL team. And the Cleveland Barons actually came from Oakland. They were the Oakland Seals. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but the Oakland Seals actually were out here for six years and then moved to Cleveland. And then I think they disbanded, didn't they, Al? Right. Uh, yeah. I think they became the North Stars. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I think it's pretty confusing, but um, I'm guessing we're getting a little far afield. Back I was going to say, we're, you know, you put two guys or three guys like us talking sports together, and the conversation is going to go off in a – into a different into a different yeah. category. Yeah, but, but we uh, do want to ask about uh, yeah. the printing the newspaper yeah. in the winter. You know, the old uh, Dewey fe- defeats Truman type of printing uh, them ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. Now you you have an interesting story about that. Al. I guess you guys printed a, a headline prior to the Warriors winning the championship game last year or two years ago at Cleveland. Tell us about that story. You know, it's it's fairly common practice in our business to print up a championship front page. We have a team in a in a, a clinching game. I love it. I love it. Now what, what, do, you, do you print both just in case? Uh, we didn't want to be warriors. So, uh, so if they didn't win, then you weren't going to worry about it. Indeed. So uh, I still have a, a, a soft spot in my heart for uh, uh, Sincerely, who I'm looking at the picture right now hanging over my, my desk here at the Chronicle. And it was just a great little moment for a great group of guys. Yeah, I, I remember that. And I, I remember thinking to myself, boy, the Chronicle, Chronicle's got to be pretty happy about that kind of publicity. But it is, it is a special moment. That kind of a moment doesn't happen in, in Cleveland. Of course, it hadn't happened in years until the Cavs upset the Warriors. And you grew up in Cleveland. 
So here you are covering the Warriors on a regular basis, but in, deep in your heart, you must be thinking of your old, uh, you know, your old t hometown and your old hometown team. That must have been kind of a conflicting situation. Yeah, this is, you know, this topic came up so many times in the last few years. It's interesting to know, you know, you mentioned you really, you know, you have to be a fan of the games, but as far as caring about who wins, uh, you, you, you have to maintain an objectivity because oftentimes you go into losing locker rooms and you have to ask the tough questions. But at the same time, I've known, and, and I've, I've traveled a lot with the Giants and, and the Raiders, two teams I grew up with as a fan, and I know deep in my heart, even though I could always be objective, I was still kind of quietly pulling for those guys. That must be tough if you're a writer. Let's say... You've covered a team for 20 years, a team that you used to follow as a kid. Even though now you're a writer, how do you how do you separate you know being a fan of the game and being a fan of the team in your writing? That's got to be a real challenge. I, I really appreciate you asking that because it, it's not so much uh, as much of a how you do it, but you have to do it. Um, I think there's a great misconception on uh, readership and, and sports journalism, um, and there's a lot of kind of. Uh, You know, it's funny, though. It, I'm thinking it's one thing to cover, you know, uh, politics. Of course, that gets kind of skewed, too. But, you yeah. know, or, or specific news events. But th there's something about sports that it's kind of like this is your home team. You know what I mean? It's, it's a little different than just saying, you know, there's a fire broke out in uh, in Florida in a bar, you know? Well, it is a part of the community. And I think Al, Al recognizes that. I, you, you spoke of that early in, in our conversation about how the importance of a newspaper to a community. For instance, the importance of the San Francisco Chronicle to the San Francisco Bay Area for sports fans is, is huge in my book. I mean, if the Chronicle wasn't around, and I'm not saying this just to make you feel good, I would have a tough time, you know, just listening to the radio and watching t television to get my news. I really like to sit down and, and get the full analysis and all the nuance. And I think, you know, that it's so important that these local uh, newspapers, which are a dying breed, unfortunately, yours included, you know, you really have to keep addressing the fact that you're a part of the community and at the same time maintain the objectivity. And as I said before, not an easy... It's super important. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of different things there. Um, while there isn't a more emotional connection to your sports team than maybe your local school board or your uh, public utilities commission, things like that, I do think it's important to remain uh, objective and, and tell the story straight, uh, especially as a newspaper. You're going to see a little bit different at AMR, for instance, uh, or at Comcast,
members of the top of the NFL when they went to the Super Bowl. We also remained objective and wrote about the pros and cons of uh, the Harbaugh's regime. And now when they, they're really in dire straits, and it's clear that the stadium's not working out for them, um, again, we're, we're selling it uh, uh, straight. So I think it's important, you know, for the good times and the bad times, to remain objective. And it's a little dull, but I do think it's something that people don't realize. Think that we're here to promote the Giants or the, the Tigers. Uh, I, I think it's important that we're here to cover. No, well, that's that's true because a lot of us readers, you know, we, we do want to know specifics rather than just okay. you know a raw raw team. But let me ask you if um, you know as the trend seems to be going more and more of less reading of a paper and looking at your smartphone and that sort of thing. What will you, what will you guys do? I mean, you're not going to stop printing newspapers. Um, I, you know, I, I have this conversation all the time. It, it's a very typical sort of conversation of any cocktail party I go to or anything like that. Um, there's been a lot of hand wringing over what's going to happen after, you know, after newspapers. The good news is it, it's already happened. Um, what we do now is we gather information, we either write down that information or produce a video about that information, and then we send it out over multiple channels. So one channel is the traditional newspaper. Another channel is, uh, is our webpage, sfchronicle.com. You can also go to sfgate.com for, uh, for our free content. Um, and that same content is then rendered to show up on your cell phone, your smartphone. You can also read it on your iPad. So basically what we're doing is slicing and dicing our content and sending it out over five or six different platforms. And the good news is you get to choose what you're comfortable with. Or if you like to sit down on the couch with the print paper, that's your option. Um, if you wanted to read it on the uh, on your cell phone while you're strap packing in your car, that's also an option. So we kind of customize it for what the reader wants, and that's already happened. We get way more readership over digital devices than we do over paper. Uh, that's up game. You can get somewhere between five and eight million people today. But the, the the fact is, though, Al, and you know this better than I, when it comes to writing for the digital media. I've noticed that the, the accounts are, are much more compact and, and synthesized, and I think that's because it's just, isn't it natural when people stare at a screen, their attention span isn't quite the same as staring at a newspaper. I've noticed this, you know. Right. It, it comes and goes. Um, you can do long-form journalism on, on the uh, on a computer or, or a smartphone, and you can do long-form journalism on a smartphone. This fall, for instance, we track the final season of Najee Harris, For Antioch. And Ron Kroitrick, one of our great uh, feature writers, and uh, he can write a good column and he writes covers all for us as well. But Ron wrote a series of long stories about Najee's life. What's it like being the number one recruit in the country? And I'll tell you, if you go on SFChronicle.com and look up the Najee Chronicle, which is what we named the series, it's absolutely gorgeous on, on, on the screen. The photography, the writing, the long form, the graphics, the videos, it actually works beautifully on, on the digital platform. So, you know, it's all emerging. This is what we started this conversation with. There's so much more with different platforms. This is really working. And the good news is the Chronicle is actually doing better than it has in many, many years. Uh, we're profitable again. We're, we're doing okay. So well, Al, it's, it's great news. Al, I, you know what? We've loved having you on, and we're going to have to have you on again. Unfortunately, we got to cut out to another commercial break here. And say goodbye. And thanks so much for joining us. I'll have a great holiday. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. Happy holidays to everyone. Else. All right. All right. That's Al Sorokovic, who's the very fine sports editor of the San Francisco Chronicle and a good friend of mine who I run into all the time at the uh, games. Just a, a very fine writer and a good guy. Very good. Okay. Got to cut to a quick break. Here's the question. In college football, what is the Ram Falcon Trophy? Stay with mm -hmm. us. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. You know I one? don't know that one at all. Hey, Ram Al. Falcon Trophy. The Rams, the only team I know that's called the Rams in college is Colorado uh, State, the Colorado State Rams. Falcons in college football? The Black Falcons? No. The Black. What, are the, what is the Army called? They're called the Black, uh, I don't know. The Army is, the Navy is the midshipmen, the Army, no, Black Knights. Black, I really? love that. Yeah. Black Ar Knights? Yeah, Army is the Black Knights. Isn't that's that cool, man. Yeah, it is, but I, I don't think What do you think cool. about it? You know, like the dark uniform. Yeah, but, uh, um, tough guys. Did you see they finally won this year after losing 15 in a row to Navy? <laughs> Can you imagine that? That's funny. God. 
Oh, I, I went out a couple days ago with a buddy of mine. We had lunch at this Mexican place that normally is pretty good. Uh -huh. And within five minutes after eating, I could tell I'd eaten something bad. Oh, no. And I had the worst. Grunge. Well, just for about a couple hours, but I felt really crappy for about a day. Ugh, it was just stomach that. stomach uh, mm. food poisoning. Yeah. It went away within a day. Yeah, it must not have been too bad. Then. No, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't bad. Okay. I just run down yesterday and just took it easy. Smart man. Yeah, got to do that sometimes. Yeah. All right, let's finish this bad boy out. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Last trivia question. In college football, what is the Ram Falcon Trophy? God, I have not a single clue. Well, you know, I, I'll break you. are getting kind of close. Well, the Colorado State Rams, yeah. that's the only college football team that I know, or basketball team or whatever team that has the name of Rams. And then the Falcons, I know there's the... Um, the uh, army is the Black Knights, but the Black Falcons. Come on, I'm thinking. Come on, think, think, no, well, no, but think, think about Falcons. Oh, Air Force Falcons. Yes. Oh, it's the game between Colorado State and Air Force. Very good. Yeah. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that that was that big a deal because I went well, to school in Denver, and, and those schools were at the opposite end, one to the north, one to the south, and they played each other, but I didn't know it was that big a deal. But I, what I'm trying to understand is I understand, <laughs> like, you know, Army, Navy, right. but Air Force, Colorado, what? what Colorado State. I know, not, not University of Colorado, Colorado okay, State. Okay, yeah, but I, mean, what, what's yeah I, I don't know. I, I know they used to play each other in basketball, uh, and once in a while in football, but Colorado State was never that good when I was there, and they used not to play them. I don't know. Maybe well, they're playing well, them now. Maybe they got a rivalry now. Where's Air Force located? Air Force is down in Colorado Springs, which is about well, 60 that's miles. That's the reason. That's because 60 they're miles, Colorado. Yeah, 60 yeah. miles south of Denver, and uh, Fort Collins is where the Colorado State University is, and that's about 40 miles north. Okay, of I mean, I can understand, yeah. like, you know, Harvard, about, Yale. They're about 100 know, miles apart, USC, basically. UCLA. Yeah. You but, know, you know, I went to school at the University of Denver, but that was a long time ago before this rivalry ever came about. I never heard well, anything. I mentioned it. the trophy was first awarded in 1957. Wow. Yeah. I must not have been Colorado. paying attention. <laughs> Here I was working on the campus media, you know, I was the voice of the pioneers. Yes, but you weren't, you weren't in college in 1957. Uh, that's true. I was in college in the 1970s, though. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Early 70s. But you hadn't heard that. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. Here's our thoughts for the day. Thoughts for the day. Harry Barden. Who's Harry Barden? Sounds like, a, I think, a famous coach. Uh, maybe. But yeah. He said, yeah, probably. Because he said, don't play too much golf. Two rounds a day or plenty. Oh, um, I'm a like former that. golfer. Yeah, exactly. Gotta be. Gotta be. Gotta that be. name sounds familiar. Okay. And Bob Birdie? Bob Birdie is a sports writer, I believe. Okay. He said, the bell that tolls. For all in boxing belongs to a cash register. Oh, that's, that's true. I, like I don't think Bob Birdie's around anymore. He was very popular back in the 70s and 80s. Tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and asking more sports trivia questions. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. All right. The one bites the show. dust. That so uh, next week, uh, 1230? Uh, you want to do 12.30? That would be actually... Or, or be, 1 o'clock. Well, uh, you know what? We do two. The 